good evening. Have you noticed how green and rich the countryside is and how our gardens are absolutely packed full of flowers? Well, we have all that's best from growers and gardeners all over the world here at the Chelsea Flower Show. And everywhere you look, it's a veritable hive of activity. People are building every kind of garden building, fencing, paving, trees, great big trees coming in, every sort of shrub. It's difficult to imagine that just 10 days ago, there was nothing more here than football pitches uh, and quiet recreation ground. And now there's just one day left for everybody to finish everything, ready for the royal visit. And of course, those judges awarding those prized gold medal awards. And then of course, the marquee, three and a half acres where the seasons meet and the daffodils of spring are side by side with chrysanthemums from the autumn. And that perennial problem, just inside the embankment entrance, the monument site. In the past, some growers have seen fit to leave the monument exposed and feature it, and others have hidden it in a veritable forest of trees. But this little copse looks hardly man enough to cover that great monument. It's part of the bonsai collection assembled by Anne Swinton down here near Taunton in Somerset. Anne, have you got enough to fill that great daunting space around that obelisk? Well, it doesn't look like it, but they're packed very, very tightly together against the wind, and they're not only in this area, but around the back, over the far side, down by the pond. I've got them everywhere. But look at that, it's a lovely old juniper. I've seen that sometimes, haven't I? Oh, Chelsea? yes. It's been to Chelsea five or six times, and it's been to a few other shows. Treasure of yours? Oh, well, very much so. One of my favourite trees, and I suppose between 250 and 300 years old. Absolutely superb tree. Everywhere I look, they're quite remarkable specimens. I mean, oh, look at this Asa here. What's, what's the history of that, then? Oh, it's a superb tree. It was owned by three generations of a Japanese family before it came to Britain, and I'm its third owner in this country. How old is it? It's 150 years old, and it's been in training that time. It has a recorded history. How on earth did you get into this bonsai growing? <laughs> Through judo. I started judo when I, when I was a teenager. And uh, because I wanted to up my standard, I stayed in London and did fine arts instead of going to Bristol to do veterinary science. And well, after that, I carried on doing judo for a while. And then... No, don't. Come on now. <laughs> you did pretty well, didn't you? At a time when there weren't many women fighting in Japan. Uh, yes, I did. I, I was a black belt very young and I fought in the first ever women's international in, that, that was held. But after that, I retired from competition and went into bonsai. And the fine art training perhaps was of some help then, was it? I think so. Uh, it was a good combination of science and fine arts and Japanese interest, really. And you've been back recently because of your uh, reputation for, for growing bonsai now to Japan. Yes, I was very honoured. I had an invitation from the Imperial family to see their whole bonsai collection at the Imperial Palace. And it, it's, oh, it's out of this world. It really is. And how did you feel when you came home then? <laughs> mm, well, uh, it, it, it's quite frightening, really, to see trees up to 800 years old. But uh, I think my trees, apart from the Imperial Collection, will stand up to a fair bit of examination. What kind of design have you got in mind for the overall staging of them? Well, it's very important for bonsai to be viewed at eye level. And this creates difficulties, and particularly on an island site. The atmosphere really is created in a different way to the way most other exhibits are put together, because you want a lot of space around the trees, and the shape of the space is very, very important. A Japanese garden is unlike an English garden in that it's only viewed from one position. You're not intended to walk through it, so each garden is an entity unto itself. Um, one prop was quite important, and, and this is a Japanese tea house. Um, I need this really because part of the exhibit will be a formal bonsai garden laid out with trees on staging. And this is actually being made locally uh, to an almost exact copy of one in the Katsura Imperial Palace in Kyoto. And the other prop is a Japanese toro. This is a bronze uh, thing about three foot high, which is currently sitting by my fireplace at home. And it looks rather like a lantern. This I was extremely lucky to obtain. It's an antique, rather lovely thing, extremely heavy. And this will go on the site and is classically situated in a Japanese garden. You could one sensibly start from something like this then? Oh yes, certainly. Uh, it's an ideal subject. You can get a thing like this from a garden centre or, or you can grow your own if you can get a cutting from somewhere. And of course it's got to a good size fairly quickly. And all you need to look for 
is to see if there's a little bit of a bend in the trunk that you can, you can shape down. You can get a curve on it. You can bring the top over. You can take a side branch down. There's plenty of side branches on this, so you can choose which ones you want to keep and which ones you want to get rid of. Yes. And it's really an ideal candidate. Yeah, and, and here's one that you've sort of been trimming away. You're trying to make these look sort of venerable then, is it? This is the idea, to try and give them an antiquity by taking the branches down, spreading them out. They're sparser. And you train them just by shaping them. And wire? I mean, haven't I heard arguments about whether you should or shouldn't wire? Um, no harm in wiring at all, provided you take it off before it cuts in. All you do is take the wire round the branch, try not to wire in any of the uh, growing green shoots, and don't wire it so tightly that it begins to strangle the, uh, the branch. And then once you've done it, and you've got it up to the top, which you should do, you then put a bend in it. It's surprising how supple these conifers are. And there, you have virtually a finished effect. Now, what about the roots and the root pruning? You've got quite a big plant down there. Is that ready for treatment? Yes, this is a big old juniper chinensis. It's about 100 years old. And as you can see, that is pot bound. There's a mass of fine fibrous roots, but lots of them, and the root ball is firm. And what I would do with that is trim off, on a root ball this size, about half an inch all the way round. Cutting all the roots off and all the soil? That's right, and I would tease out some of the remaining roots, and then I would put the tree back into the pot with some fresh soil in it, and the few roots I'd teased out will grow into that fresh soil. Now, what about the things that flower? I mean, there's flowering crabs very often, and peaches. What are you doing with those? Because we've got five weeks to go to Chelsea, and there's some timing involved. Ah, oh, well, a refrigerator's very useful. Um, the ones that have to be held back that would normally flower around this time of year have been in my fridge and my partner's fridge for quite a while. <laughs> so even the kitchen's <laughs> invaded. That's right. <laughs> and I can't wait to see them. Thank you very much for showing us behind the scenes. Lovely, thank you. On this huge site, it looks as if Anne may even have too many trees because each plant is a work of art and needs to be seen individually, like a picture spotlit on the studio wall. And then we have to generate the right atmosphere with the tea house. It took 10 men with strong poles and the aid of a forklift truck to lift that into place. And then the toro, traditionally in Japan, surrounded by the fine-leaved zelkoba and the purple-stemmed willow. But Japan or Britain in May, it has to be azaleas and rhododendrons, and it certainly wouldn't be the Chelsea show without rhododendrons. Traditionally, rhododendron nurseries were hewn out of wooded countryside on the acid, sandy soils of Bagshot in Surrey and here at Item in Kent. One much respected family firm who were at the first Chelsea Flower Show are still showing and it's now run by Jean Reuter. Jean, the name, it sounds German. Yes, so it is German. My grandfather originally came from Lower Saxony, Aschersleben to be exact, and um, he worked all over Europe as a young lad in St Petersburg, Paris, um, all through um, Europe and decided that he'd like to come to England because he found Germany a very intolerant country. He hated militarism and he hated the, the fact that youth was being dragooned so he decided to come to England and he became naturalised at the age of 30. But your father had that same interest in rhododendrons that his father had. Yes indeed, he was, that was one of his absorbing passions and uh, it uh, did get a little irksome during the war because we couldn't eat rhododendrons, but uh, uh, during, after the war, of course, we blossomed out with the shows and uh, trade increased and uh, we've done quite well since. And uh, we are rhododendron specialists. Was it a difficult burden then for you to carry as third generation? Yes, it was difficult at first because originally I, I didn't seem to have a lot of interest in it, but it, it grew on me and it's grown on me so much it's become my life really and uh, an absorbing passion. How many varieties do you grow here? I think we do grow about, um, at the moment, about 500 or so, uh, and uh, about um, 100 different species, but we find that only about 60 species are really commercial now, which is very, very sad. When it comes to showing, what are the difficulties? I mean, the climatic well, well, problems. Yes, the difficulties are, uh, are paramount. In some years, you get a lot of frosts, and this can play havoc with the buds and you can get hail storms, you can get almost anything. You've got to get them under cover in good time because Mother Nature is so fickle, so <laughs> treacherous. There's no regard for our susceptibilities, I'm afraid. 
Some people laughingly say that the Royal Horticultural Society should be the Rhododendron Horticultural Society. But you've contributed considerably to the quality of rhododendrons displayed over the years. What sort of success have you had? Well, we've always put up a good group, but in 1974, 1975, 1976, we did get gold medals, which was very heartening. We did very large groups, which perhaps were a little too large for us. And then, of course, in 1976, we didn't get a gold medal, and it was a terrible demoralisation for us all. Why, why didn't you uh, We just didn't quite make it. The plants weren't quite so good, but we had to do the same amount of work, and it nearly killed everybody. And uh, there was tremendous gloom over us at Chelsea. So after that, we cut down the size of our group, and now we're building up again. We've got two gold medals behind us, and we, of course, hope to get a third. We're still trying desperately. <laughs> we're trying desperately this moment. Time to perfection, but not without an awful lot of work. Gene and his staff have been lifting those varieties in and out the heated greenhouse. Those with tight buds, doused with warm water repeatedly, and those that were coming out too fast, lifted from the glass and put in the shade and doused with cold water. And now there are so many, what looks to me to be the best, have been put to one side. They're going to go on the van any minute now and will be returned unused. And everywhere you look, the start. It doesn't matter whether it's milk crates or old boxes, as long as they're strong enough to take the weight. But the retaining walls need to be attractive, old timber and even peat walling. But that has to be wet, so that it will provide moisture right through the show. And then each flower has to be positioned properly. The pollen removed and the stamens from lilies picked so those petals aren't soiled. And the labelling, all those keen gardeners wanting to know just what every plant is. So the label has to be positioned and clearly produced. Traditionally, Chelsea never changes, and yet no two shows are the same either. The people change and the varieties. Everybody's waiting with bated breath to see just what new roses come, and there's lots of new ones this year. And I haven't seen that ground cover Nozomi grown on a standard quite so well as we see it this year. And the style of stands change. The National Farmers Union have got that great wooden structure like Fort Worth, and I'm told there's thatched roofs to come here. For well over a hundred years, the same family have been growing marvellous roses down here in the quiet Oxfordshire countryside. And on this sharp, cold, early April morning with the first signs of growth on the bushes, seems an awful long way to Chelsea and roses in full bloom. The business is now in the hands of the fourth generation, John and Mark Mattock. Mark, you're in charge of administration and retailing. Things must have changed a lot since your, let me think, your great-grandfather's time. That's correct from the time when he was a, a nursery boy to the present moment when we're growing close on 400,000 roses on 30 acres. Uh, we have the extensive rose fields here that thousands of people come to see during the summer. We have, of course, the garden centre and shop and these display gardens. But then why go to Chelsea? Uh, wherever I go, in uh, Texas or New Zealand, people are talking about the Nunham Courtney roses. Well, this is the inducement to get people to come to look at us. To see, they come and see the roses at Chelsea, and so they have to, have to come to Nunham Courtney to see them growing. Now, John, you're in charge of the Chelsea exhibit. Can we expect the same sort of thing from you this year? No, we're hopefully we're going to be slightly different. We're going to be somewhat innovative in the way we're displaying roses, and more important still, we're going to introduce the rose as an environmental plant. Now, it's pretty cold out here. I presume the roses are protected somewhere, aren't they? Oh, yes, they're all grown in greenhouses. We have to fetch them on that much earlier for Chelsea. This is the block of greenhouses that is 90% devoted to the production of the stand at Chelsea. All the bushes are planted in the soil then. How long have they been in here? Some have been in 20 years, some have been in two, according to how new they are. And what sort of material do you plant? They're exactly the same plants that you'd have put in in your own garden, maiden plants. Really? So the gardener could do it himself. When would he plant? He would have planted these last October. I see. Now, how do you cope with the varieties that grow very quickly, the early flowering ones, and those slow developers that flower late? I mean, how do you get all these different varieties to flower at the same time? Well, the late developers are pruned very early. They were pruned sometime like last November, whereas the uh, very quick developers are pruned sometime about the middle of this January. Well, now, as I look at them in the tips, it looks as if those are just swelling up with flower buds. Are they about right? Yes, we're rather pleased with the way they're coming on this year. It's been a very difficult spring, but we're within about three days of, of accuracy. We, we have to cut 
on May the 20th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we're about three days ahead of that. Are you serious? Can you really get them to the hour for 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon? Oh, yes, absolutely, right to the hour. But then over there, there's some in pots. Is that a sort of special contingency in case things don't no, work? No, no, right? that's another part of the exhibit. These are cut flower. Those across there are the environmental side, the, 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 the whole plant that's being shown. What do you mean by an environmental rose? A type of rose that's very, very easy to maintain in the garden, will cover vast areas. They won't be gangling and tall, they'll be short, they'll cover these areas to eliminate weeds and be very healthy. But aren't you going to have to demonstrate them in a different way then on the stand? Yes, the idea is to plant these in large squares and put them at different heights so we've got different areas of colour. and. Uh, get, show the variation that one can use with these different types of ground cover plants. So it'll be quite a contrast, these big round bowls full of the traditional flowers in full bloom, contrasting with the squares beneath. But aren't you worried about the reaction to the visitors looking at this for the first time? Well, we're absolutely confident where everybody's going to enjoy it. And I think most important of the lot is that we're going to have a lot of fun doing it as well. Thank you, John. Thank you. Red Max Graff ground cover rose in full flower and the others in bud and opening. Just give them 24 hours for the leaves to settle and they'll look as if they've been there forever. And at this very moment, John Mattock and his staff cutting all those roses to fill 70 to 80 bowls and troughs with perfect blooms. Eleven years ago, David Clark was a research chemist working for a leading drug company in Dagnum with a keen amateur interest in growing orchid cactus. Surplus plants were sold to cover expenses and the sales increased to the point a decision had to be made. Not surprisingly, he opted for the attractive Hampshire countryside and full-time employment in horticulture. Why epiphyllums? I mean, what attracted you to the, that particular plant? Well, basically it's the bright, brilliant colours and the fact that when the flower starts to open, um, they open immediately. Not much connection between uh, epiphyllums and research chemistry though, is there? Well, I, th I think there is actually. When I was studying chemistry, um, I really wanted to be a dye stuffs chemist. And it's, I think, the brilliant saturated colours of these flowers that really attract me. But now it's other plants that uh, earn your living though. Yes, it is. Well, why not epiphyllums? Well, basically, um, the other plants are more saleable. Uh, we wanted to expand, and I felt that fuchsias and pelargoniums um, offered a much greater scope for expansion. After just five years of showing at Chelsea, you have a tremendous reputation for specimen plants. I mean, can we lift one of these up? Yes. The sheer size of the plant uh, against the size of the pot, absolutely huge. I mean, are you happy with that? Well, not really. It's what I term a good uh, commercial specimen. You mean as an amateur you do better than that? Oh yes, an amateur grower with more time um, and fewer plants um, should be able to trim uh, much more frequent, the, frequently than we do and produce a much better quality plant. And how many varieties are you growing? Um, we keep our list to approximately 100 to 120 varieties. Any favourites? Um, well, yes, um, this variety here, display. Uh, beautiful dark green foliage requires remarkably little attention to produce quite a, an acceptable specimen. And how about the red and white at the end? Snowcap, yes, um, that's been grown by many an amateur and professional for many years and still a favourite. I can see lots of people though wanting big double flowers like Dark that. eyes, yes. Gorgeous thing. And the white, that, that's a basket variety, is it a pendular variety? Uh, like a lot of um, fuchsias, it tends to grow rather in an upright fashion until the large, uh, heavy flowers come and then the whole plant weeps in a rather graceful fashion. Can you take a cutting here and show us then the various stages yes, of certainly. cultivation? Hey, you better borrow my knife. Basically, the best cutting material comes from a non-flowering shoot. Now, any tips then when you're taking these cuttings? Well, yes, it's quite easily, really. Just trim the cutting to this sort of length. You don't even need to trim to below a pair of leaves. Dip it in hormone rooting powder, though that isn't absolutely necessary, but it does help to um, even up the difference uh, in rooting time between the particular varieties. 
just dibble it into one of these little pre-prepared uh, peat blocks. And then how long then, from that stage to this? They root under the correct conditions of high humidity, um, slight shade, in uh, seven to ten days, and they are grown to this size in about three weeks. And then this? After potting up a plant of this size, it takes another up to six weeks to reach this size. And then the obvious question then? Well, after a, an intermediate stage of potting, um, certainly within a year. And then is it the same with pelargoniums? Uh, the basic considerations are very similar, yes. Regal Pelargonium Pink Bonanza. Do you ever see such a marvellous specimen in such a modest size pot? You'd have to travel some miles to see a plant like that in a garden centre, I think. Dave, why grow such big plants when I suppose you could earn a living with, you know, the ordinary, more modest size thing? Well, yes, I think we could. But I like to, for people to see and to realise the full potential that these plants are capable of. And by putting on a good display at Chelsea, where we meet other nurserymen, visitors from abroad. It gives us so much publicity that we can do business for the whole 12 months of the year, just on that basis. A surefire gold medal winner, I should think. You've just got to get them there safely. Well, yes, that is the problem. And David really caught his breath when he opened those van doors, because those giant standards had fallen over to a full 45 degrees. But fortunately, there was ropes across the van and they'd taken the weight, and so they could carefully comb the branches of that great checkerboard standard away from the other varieties. And with all that warm sunshine, then even those slow and the last to flower were in full bloom. So there'll be a tremendous range here for the visitors to see. Who would have thought it? Easter weekend in Torquay, and the sky is bluer than the travel catalogues. Nothing could be further from the minds of holiday visitors as they revel in the sunshine and dig in the sand in the Chelsea Flower Show. They may well have come to see the bedding displays and the flowering plants for which the three towns of Torbay are justly famous. But it's a big job, more than 100 people working all year to keep this lot planted, tended and attractive. Mr. Bob Sweet, your uh, Parks and Recreations Office of uh, Tor Bay, pretty impressive sort of set of premises you've got here. Yes, we're very lucky. We had this new nursery built the year before last. How much grass have you got? Well, it's just under an acre here altogether, and uh, it serves all of our needs for the borough. And what are you growing in here, then? Well, we have a house full of tropical plants, and we use those primarily for civic decoration. We use them for conferences, too, because that's very, very important to the economy of the local authority. And there are masses of bedding, presumably, for all those seaside... Uh... Yes, we grow somewhere in the region half a million bedding plants. And again, bedding is extremely important. We want visitors in Torbay, and therefore we want Torbay to be bright and colourful for them. And how big come. an area are you covering, then? Well, we have 2,000 acres altogether of public open space, um, which takes some planning and uh, takes some maintenance, too. And then there's Chelsea. I mean, last year, the first time Torbay at Chelsea, you won a gold medal, didn't you? We did. I don't know if it was beginner's luck or not. What about this year? We're growing a guardsman on a horse. Looks like a welder's delight in the middle there with all a twisted wire. Yes, it does. Um, this frame is needed, of course, for strength because all of the weight of the peat and the plants to go on there makes the whole thing very, very um, heavy. Yeah. Who's actually done this work? The local blacksmith has assembled it for us and, of course, it looks pretty grotesque at the moment, doesn't it? Who actually researched what the guardsman would look like in the finer detail? One of our team, John Carnell, carried out all of the detailed investigations of the actual design of the horse and how it was going to be dissected. He must have been burning the midnight oil, I think. He was for a number of days on this one, yes. And now there's got to be some very intricate planting. Yes, again, our expert, Henry Davy, is the person who's responsible for carrying that out and uh, Henry will be working out exactly where he can put plants and where he can't put them. Now then, come on, some of those inside secrets. What's actually in here? Well, actually, we filled the main body of the horse with polystyrene. 
Oh, that's quite simple, yes. So you haven't got a lot of sort of heavy stuff to carry it's up It's strong like. with not too much weight. And then you can see we've got about three inches of peat to form the outside of the body. And the echeverias are being inserted and firmed into the peat. Now, will they stay there, all right? Oh, yes, they'll stay there. And they don't need a lot of water through the whole period they're going to be there. Well, isn't it a bit of a waste? I mean, there must be thousands no, of No, because uh, when we've come back from Chelsea, we shall then be dismantling it and taking it along to the carpet bedding design on the Torquay Sea front. How many plants in all do you have? Well, I'm use? estimating we should lose at least over 12,000 plants. Goodness. Well, then what about the unusual things? I mean, the guardsman's helmet's got to be black, hasn't it? Yeah, well, then I hand over that something to Mr. Sweet to decide on what he's going to use for What have you found helmet? for us for black? Well, we've managed to find a very nice Ophiopogen, which um, we were unaware of, which, as you can see, is completely black. You're going to get that on the helmet, all right? We hope so, yes. How many of those are you going to need, though? Well, we think we'll probably need about 50 to complete the uh, busby of the uniform. And that's all right. Henry, you got enough of those? Oh, yes, I've got enough of those. And what I should do is to, when the head is uh, taken away from the body, I shall then push the plants up inside the head and thread it through the wires. So it's sort of all hang downwards just to give the effect. And then what about the hooves? What have you selected for the hooves? Well, we're using Autonantra for hooves, and we've got different colours of Autonantra, which you can see here on the bench. But, but aren't they quite tricky to grow? I mean, how about the inside of the legs, Henry? They're quite tricky. They need a lot of heat during the winter months, and then you've got to be very careful at this time of the year they don't get too much sun as they will scorch. Yes, and then how about the scarlet tunics? I mean, what have you found, Bob, for that? Well, again, it's another Autonantra which we use, and uh, you can see that one, which is just beginning to colour now, um, it has a little way to go yet before the show. Looks pretty green to me, Henry. You, you really oh, can make this scarlet? It'll be all right, it'll be all right. I can show you it'll be all right. We'll take off all the unwanted bits and just leaves you that lovely bright colour. And you'll get it there all right? Definitely. I can't wait to see it. Thank you. Thank you. At last, that head safely lowered into position. And you ratepayers in Torbay, if you've wondered where the park gates went from Abbey Park, they've taken the opportunity of refurbishing to bring them up here just for four days to show the rest of the world and what an eye-catcher they'll be. And the one man who sits patiently is the guardsman. He's just waiting to be mounted on his horse. Outside there are more gardens than ever this year, I think, and the weather's been pretty kind to the builders too. But then it is the weather that makes or breaks this show and all that hot sunshine in July and August, that ripened the wood and gave us lots of blossom on the trees. But then there were some worried faces in March when the weather turned cold. But fortunately we had that bright sun in April and cold breezes. And uh, really if uh, you do get that cool and bright sunlight, that's how you get the quality. And speaking to a Chelsea pensioner just a few minutes ago, he said, this show gets better every year. And I think he's right. But if you'd like to come to see for yourself, then it's open to members on Tuesday and you can join at the gate and then for everyone Wednesday and Thursday from 8 in the morning till 8 in the evening and then on Friday from 8 till 5 and it's not a bad idea to come about half past 3 or 4 on Wednesday and Thursday when it's a pound or two cheaper and it's not quite so crushed but whether you come or not I hope you'll join Alan Titchmarsh and I on BBC 2 Wednesday evening at 10 past 8 until then good night to you